actually the first EAA presentation I've given. So you guys are actually going to be helping me a lot by providing feedback on was this informative, how did it help you. Um, so any comments you have, you know, very informal. If you have any questions, just raise your hand. And then at the end, if, if you have some hints or tips for me, that'd be great. I'd, I'd be more than welcome to hear any suggestions on this presentation. Uh, a little bit of history on, on Dynavive. Dynavive was developed back in 1999 for experimental helicopters. So that's how we kind of got started. Experimental helicopters, by nature, are trying to come apart. Uh, there's a lot of vibration. And uh, we, we worked to develop the software. It's actually a picture of me back when I had hair that uh, we actually used a laptop and a data acquisition system and had to hover the helicopter over it so we could collect the data and a lot of work. Um, one of the things about the Dynavive is it's made to only look at the uh, vibrations caused by the rotating equipment. So that kind of makes, uh, let me explain that a little bit. For the rotor on a helicopter, you only want to see the rotor vibration. You want to kind of disregard the engine vibration. So that's one of the things the Dynavite does. It only tells you the vibration that's generated by the one per, the one per revolution. So we have a lot of questions about geared engines. You know, can you use this on a geared engine? Uh, the Dynavite only looks at the vibration from the propeller because we're, we're synced into the propeller. Uh, we also designed it to be very simple and easy to use. A lot of the uh, external helicopter guys are a little crazy, so you don't want to give them too much power. Uh, I, I joke that a lot of my friends are external helicopter guys. They're, they're pretty crazy. Uh, so the original equipment was kind of designed in 1999, but really designed by it started in 2006. Uh, we, uh, a partner of mine and I went in and bought a Cessna 172, and we bought it on our mechanic's suggestion that it was a good plane and we did it and it was shaking and uh, we didn't know what we were going to do so we took the helicopter vibration analyzer, put it on the Cessna 172, figured out what the problem was, uh, the propeller had a, a strange warp in it that the tip, when you tried to track it, the tip was okay but the middle of the blade was out so of course we sent it to a prop shop and uh, we thought hey this is this is really a valuable tool for having around the airport for propellers instead of just helicopters. So we kind of redesigned it, packaged it, um, did a lot of research. Um, I, I've got the NIST traceable listed here. One of the things that we really review a lot is the advisory circular 20-37. Uh, the FAA advisory circular 2037 talks about propeller maintenance. Uh, you know, mix that you can repair, should you paint or not paint. So that's a really good resource uh, for people that are wanting to do propeller maintenance. That advisory circular is a great resource. Now, one of the things it talks about is that you have to use applicable procedures for certified ships. You also have to be an appropriately rated mechanic. So if somebody brought up the point earlier about certified aircraft, you do have to be an appropriately rated mechanic to do that. Experimental is a little more wide open. Uh, one of the requirements is NIST, that's the National Institute of Standards. Uh, all the Dynavibes are NIST traceable, but it's the paperwork that you have to have to put in the logbook for a certified aircraft. So uh, you guys got the NIST certificate, uh, so you've got the, the traceability to say that the instrument is calibrated. Same thing with the torque wrench, you know, if you're using a torque wrench on a certified aircraft, it's supposed to be calibrated to verify its performance. So uh, it's got the missed case story. Uh, one of the other things that we'll see when looking at the Dynavibe, one of the things I wanted to bring up is the way that the vibration is displayed. Uh, we work in inches per second, which is a velocity. It's a little weird because the accelerometer is measuring acceleration. We report it in velocity, and the buzz, the, the amount it shakes, is a distance. So all the units get messed up, and it's usually confusing because it's like well, you're using an accelerometer, but you're reporting in velocity. It's the industry standard to report vibration in inches per second. So you'll hear me use the word ips. It means inches per second. And that's the velocity that the front of that engine is jumping up and down. So I uh, just wanted to kind of describe some of that. The other piece of information we give you is the phase angle. That's the position, and we'll kind of go through that. 
but it, the device essentially tells you here's the magnitude of the vibration and here's the position of the heavy spot. And that's really the key because a lot of the experimental helicopter guys would, they would just start putting weight on and go, well, that's a little better, that's a little worse. So the magic is that it gives you the position of the heavy spot. So everybody can kind of feel the vibration, but they can't tell where it's at. That's what the dive box is going to do. It's going to tell you, here's the heavy spot. And then you can either take weight off there, or you can add it to the opposite side. That reduces the vibration. So one of the things that I'm real big about is the pre-balance inspection. So a lot of our um, issues that may come up, problems customers have, usually go back to the pre-balance inspection. So just a, a few list items here of things that we should look for. Uh, obviously the first one are any ADs or service bulletins. Uh, there was an AD out about if you put this engine and propeller together, you have to switch to Lord mounts. Uh, we had a customer that didn't know that. So there are, there are specific combinations of engine and propeller, uh, modifications to propellers. So you always want to check with the ADs and the service bulletins to make sure that the, uh, the airframe or the, air, the engine power plant is in the correct configuration. Uh, applicable procedures, there's a lot of different procedures out there. Uh, Advisory Circular 2037 has a description of some procedures. Uh, a lot of the propeller manufacturers will have uh, descriptions of procedures. Uh, we had a guy with a CB that's got this, it's like a three foot prop extension hanging out the back of the engine in a pusher configuration, and you've got to go try and find the procedure for that particular aircraft. It, it can be challenging. Uh, blade inspection. We've, we've had customers, ag guys, that will actually have two different blades on their airplane. They'll have one blade on one side and a different part number pitch and blade on the other side. So blade inspection can be as gross as that, or it could be simply, you know, nicks color damage, uh, pitting, again, back to advisory circular 2037, a lot of that's covered about how to do the maintenance to you know, take care of nicks, uh, pitting, all those items. So you want to do a good thorough blade inspection. Uh, another item is spinner installation. We've had, I don't know how many questions about, I'm having difficulty balancing the propeller. And I'll usually say, does it have a spinner? They say yes. And I'll say it's fiberglass, they'll say yes, and I'll say take the spinner off and run it again. A lot of these fiberglass spinners, you can lay them on the table and they'll roll to one side. And so the spinner is out of balance. The problem with that is that you can't balance at the front of the spinner, you're balancing at the propeller. So that's just kind of a, an FYI when you guys are doing this. If you start running into problems, kind of back up and check the spinner. Uh, check the spinner back plate, those types of issues are only going to lead to a sequence of problems. So I usually actually, the first time I run, I'll take the spinner off just so it's, uh, it, it's not a, a problem. If your spinner, if you can grab the nose and move it around, we've actually seen a lot of spinners where you can move them a quarter inch uh, from the front. What will happen is you start it up and all of a sudden you'll, you'll see it start orbiting at higher RPM as that spinner shifts to one side. And you'll get this random phase angle as the spinner just kind of deflects around. So I usually grab the front of the spinner and wiggle it a little bit to make sure it's not loose. Uh, it's, it's good to check that. Another one is uh, blade track and pitch. And these items are in the manual. So when you, guys, you can actually download a copy of the manual. I can send you an email, uh, take a look at it. The blade track and pitch is, is one of the items. Um, back again to advisory circular 2037, 16th of an inch is the maximum allowed track error. So I don't know if you guys have ever done that, but you pull the plugs out, rotate the blade, check that the blade is in a certain position, rotate the blade again, they should always be within about a 16th of an inch. I actually prefer less than that because I've seen a lot of 16th of an inch difficult to balance if it's out that far. Another one is pitch. Uh, we've had a couple of issues where one blade is at a different angle, and a lot of that won't apply uh, to you guys. But sometimes when they put the blade assembly together, there's a way that it can be off by one notch. 
So you can actually take one of these digital protractors and measure the blade angle, and it should all, they should all be the same. If you've got one blade that's a different angle, that, that'll be a problem. Uh, what will happen is that blade will make more lift. It's, it's almost like you've got a higher angle of attack, and then as it rotates, it shows up as a, as a vibration. So it's, it's good to check that, especially um, some of these guys that have the adjustable props that don't necessarily get clocked. Uh, those can be out a couple of degrees, and that will make a, a significant vibration. What will happen is you'll balance at one RPM, and then as soon as you change to a different RPM, the balance goes away. And you'll see that with the dime body. You run through the RPMs, the vibration should continuously go up. You shouldn't have spikes at certain RPMs. Uh, compression, that, that's kind of a, an obvious one, but uh, I've worked through a couple of cases where the guy's having trouble and come to find out one cylinder's zero out of 80 and the rest of them are good. It, it, it's really a great tool to try and troubleshoot those other issues. If, if it doesn't work the way it's supposed to work, there's a problem dig into it. Uh, installation of equipment. Uh, there's a, a photo tack that is used to see the blade. So the photo tack uh, looks for a piece of tape on the blade. As the blade is spinning, the photo tack will see that piece of tape. And so that tilts the computer, you know, the blade went by, the blade went by, and it gives us all the timing information. The next piece is the accelerometer. This is actually measuring the acceleration